Okay, good afternoon. Well, they turned up the volume on this one. Um, we have another wonderful speaker for you today that I'm going to introduce in just a second. But just uh, one further reminder, uh, when I pass around the attendance sheet, uh, do check and make sure I've given you credit for all the write-ups you have done. Uh, if I'm missing any of your write-ups, uh, please let me know that because we want to make sure we give you all credit for the write-ups that you've done. Uh, the MBAs are still ahead of the engineers, even though we have more engineers in the class. So engineering students, it's time to get on the stick. Uh, we've only got a few sessions left. Um, so with that, let me pass this around and uh, introduce today's speaker. Um, we are going to hear today from a company that was doing open innovation before the term had even been coined. Uh, Procter & Gamble has really been a leader uh, in this whole area particularly in the consumer domain. So last week we heard from SAP that was really a company that makes software that's typically bought by other businesses, sort of a business-to-business -business company. Today we're going to hear about a business that's dealing directly with consumers. So many, many, many millions more customers to worry about and how then to give customers what they want, to leverage useful external knowledge from other places and so forth. I think what you'll see today uh, is perhaps the foremost example of outside-in open innovation in the consumer space that I know of. Uh, it's been a journey. It wasn't perfect from the beginning, and we're going to hear about that journey today. And our speaker to guide us through this journey is Ashish Chatterjee, uh, who is the Managing Director of Global Business Development for Connect and Develop. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ashish. Okay. Thank you. All right. So a very good afternoon to all of you. Um, this will be hopefully a very informal discussion. Um, and I'm counting on learning from your experiences, as you have had many speakers who I'm sure know a lot more about open innovation than I do. And hopefully, I can convey some of the points that we have learned in our journey. So with that, I'll start with a video. When the idea of Connect and Develop first started within Procter & Gamble, I never, ever conceived that it could be as big as it is today. And it would have contributed to so many of our innovations and been such a strategic part of our business and our R&D innovation program. Connect and Develop has opened up a whole new world for us. We really have a mascara business today because of Connect and Develop. Febreze, which is the company's newest billion dollar brand, would not be here today at the speed that we got here without Connect and Develop as a key strategy. I see C&D as a critical enabler to P&G becoming the number one beauty company in the world. Connect and Develop program is all based on trust. I feel like we're all one company working together. C&D has helped all the businesses of P&G grow. We've quickly seen over time that when we open up to partnerships, we can get there much faster, more efficiently, and often with better products for our consumers. People are quite excited, and, and it's really, it's kind of neat to celebrate 10 years of Connect and Develop. But in some ways, I have to tell you, I think we're really, we're really kind of at the adolescent stage. You know, we've got our personality, we've got some successes, but the untapped potential of Connect and Develop, I think, is just huge. All right, so it's been a journey for us. Um, as you would have seen from the video, we started about 10 years ago. And while it has been an exciting journey, a rewarding journey, it remains challenging because Connect and Develop or Open Innovation or C&D, and I will use these words interchangeably throughout today, um, those, that, that field continues to evolve. So it's not like there is a prescribed set of methodologies that you can follow and you can get there. You evolve as the whole innovation ecosystem is evolving and you frankly adapt to it and learn to leverage it the best you can. So, um, Hank was kind enough to introduce me um, a little bit more about my background. Um, I grew up in India. I'm a chemical engineer by profession. 
Um, and I worked for three years after graduation in ICI, which is a British company, at Mumbai. Thereafter, I went in for my master's degree in chemical engineering from the US. And then I joined Procter & Gamble in Japan. That was 22 years ago. Um, I was eight years in Japan working on process development in the paper arena, working on consumer brands like Pampers, Always. Um, we used to have an adult incontinence business at that time. Um, and then I, migr I, then I moved to Cincinnati, uh, which is our world headquarters. And I was there for 10 years, um, working on product development that included product research, or what we call consumer research, then product design, and then finally onto business teams, uh, working on the North America business team. So a gamut of experiences. So after those uh, 10 years, I moved into Bangalore, um, heading up the Bangalore Innovation Center, which is a small innovation center that we had just started up. And that was my first foray into open innovation. Um, so I started working the Asia network. And the network in Asia comprised India, China, and Japan principally. And we expanded that into Singapore and Korea. Last July, I came back into Cincinnati. And this is what I do. All right. So um, what we're going to cover today is we'll start with our uh, ubiquitous question on what is open innovation. I'm sure a lot of definitions have surfaced so far. So we'll see what, what we understand of it. And then why did we do it? And how did we get started? And so on. And we'll, we'll come to what are the key tips that I would have for people on this journey based on our learning. And be anxious to see what you have learned in that process. So what is it? Uh, so to do that, we could define it, or we could use this video. So we'll prefer to see this video. So there's two parts to the open innovation model. One part is bringing great ideas from the outside into your business. And the value of that is you get a much richer set of tools to work with, some possibly new ideas, new markets, new customers, and it can add to the stuff that you have internally. The second part of the model is letting the stuff you have inside that may be stuck and not going anywhere internally, letting that go to the outside. Can you explain to me what the benefit is of giving away internal ideas? Twofold. One is it helps find new revenue streams uh, from these ideas as they spin out. Generally not very large revenue streams, but you do get real customers buying real stuff that they pay real money for. So it's the best market research you can buy to find new markets. And so if your stuff is going out to these new areas, it gives you new ideas about where you could grow in your own businesses. What are the potential detriments to open innovations, and what are you doing to avoid those? Most companies that have a strong uh, tradition of science-based leadership in their industry typically have some form of not invented here. If we didn't invent it, it must not be very good. That's the not invented here syndrome. Uh, so you have to really overcome that cultural barrier without taking away the heritage of excellence that gave rise to it. You have to convince your very smart people that now in this new model, there's still an awful lot of need for their talents and skills, but they have a new job now. And the new job is to connect to the other really smart people that don't work at the organization. So what is the future of open innovations? Where does it go next? In this most recent incarnation, uh, my new book, Open Services Innovation, extends this way of thinking into the services sector which is the largest part of the U.S. economy and really all of the OECD economies. Most of them now are services based in terms of the percentage of GDP. So we have to think about innovation in that sector. And it turns out a lot of the ideas in open innovation carry over to this area, but there's some important differences about how you have to focus centrally on customers, the intangibility of these services, and the ability to construct platforms that attract lots of people to build alongside and on top of what you're doing. All right, so that is open innovation for us. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's, it's a, it's a two-sided, um, two-way uh, exchange of ideas, intellectual property, products, services, etc. And what we do in Procter & Gamble is we do both of them. 
Um, what you are going to see today are examples primarily from bringing things out from the outside in. Um, we also do a lot of work on inside out, and that contributes $3 billion um, annually. That's our licensing. That's our licensing arm. So it, it is important um, to have both sides. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the intangibles that are associated with doing work that way, having a two-sided exchange. All right? So why do we do it? Um, it's fairly simple. Um, if you want to collaborate, if you cannot collaborate in the world of tomorrow, we, we don't see a future, frankly. Um, it's not about being big. So you have a lot of research budgets, and you can do all this innovation, because innovation is not predictable. We know that. So how do you get the portfolio that you need to be able to bring stuff to the market year over year over year to be able to grow a, a, a business that's uh, $82 billion? If you, if you think about Wall Street, 5 to 7% a year of $82 billion, that's, you, need, you need a decent portfolio. And you have to manage the risk in that portfolio. If you do everything internally, all the risk is yours. So if you were to collaborate, then you can manage the risk and the reward. Someone else benefits along with you, which is fine. So um, how we got started. So when I go to this, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on Procter & Gamble. Um, besides the sales we are talking about here, um, really the passion part of, part of it what makes me work 22 years in the company is this last line here. Dedicated to touching and improving lives. That is our mission. That's our core mission. And we serve consumers at all, side, at, at all ends of the consumer spectrum and, and, and over, over there. So the top end to the bottom end. That's our continuing quest. And today we believe we serve about 4 billion consumers. That's, that's the number of people who actually touch or experience a P&G brand anywhere in the world in a given day. And what we try to do, what we would like to go and do is add a billion to it, so in, in the next four, four years. Now, that is, that is a slogan that you will hear if you were to do some research on it, you will hear from many companies. They all want to add the next billion consumers. Um, so, of course, and where will they come from? They will come from probably Asia. Central and Eastern Europe, um, and, and potentially LA Africa, but it'll be probably mostly from the first two. Um, what gives you a competitive edge that we believe in is that we are completely consumer-centric. The consumer drives it, that's the basis of our, of our decisions. Um, so this is, this is very fundamental for us. Um, innovation is how we have grown the company. We have been around for 175 years. So as you think about companies that are growing big, uh, that are growing fast, we're, you know, we are big, but we are not fast. But we have been around for 175 years, and our intent is to stay for the next 175. So when you say what motivates open innovation, it's that desire to change along with changes in the, in the spectrum within which you operate. Okay. Um, now, um, we invest behind it. So um, our, our research budget, so we spend about $2 billion in a year on research, um, and it's ahead of any of our uh, competitors. And we hire some of the best. Um, uh, as you can see here, the numbers are, you know, we have more than 1,000 PhDs, uh, more than 8,000 people in R&D, um, lots of uh, patents and stuff as a, as a result. And we do 20,000 consumer studies per year because we say the consumer is boss. That is, that is something that we passionately believe in. The consumer is boss. If the consumer, the consumer always has a choice not to buy your product. And, when every, and every day, if they are touching your brands, then they always have a chance to say no. So how do you get them to always vote for your brand? That's, that's why the consumer is boss. Um, innovation is how we have grown, and as you can see, right right from the beginning, ivory, um, ivory soap, all the way to Tide Pods, which were introduced into the market this year. Tide Pods are things that we have, uh, I don't know if the samples came in here. So there are some samples here. Feel, these are for you. 
as you as you you can you can do them you can do them anytime. Um, um, this can just go around and please help yourself. Um, the point of this slide is that we have products that have been first to the market in their category on multiple occasions. This is not about coming from behind and trying to win, though there have been one, one or two instances of that. Um, if we have been ahead in a category, we have tried to keep uh, the lead in that category. So here's a couple of examples. Um, so Ivory, um, this, was, this was a collaboration. Now, it goes back to 1879, so some of the recollection is a bit fuzzy. But uh, from what we can make out from the archives, uh, James Gamble, who was one of the founders, along with William Proctor, um, uh, did a deal to get cheaper soap um, through, through a collaboration. Crisco shortening, this was the first all vegetable shortening on the market. And this was a, this was a collaboration with a German chemist. Um, he, had, uh, he had a paper on hydrogenation of unsaturated fatty acids. And we were working on trying to get cotton, cotton seed oil into a shortening. We, we, we actually invited William Kaiser over to Cincinnati, and that was our licensing agreement that allowed us to take, go to market with the all vegetable shortening. Now, in the grand scheme of things, these may look like small things, but that is our business. Um, Crest toothpaste. Um, that's something I think a lot of us may be familiar with, and hopefully you buy them. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of competition. Um, and this, was the, this, this toothpaste was developed by a collaboration with the University of Indiana. They were, they were working on, uh, uh, on using a fluoride compound to be able to prevent tooth decay. We were able to work with them jointly and develop a paste that would allow the fluoride to be available on the teeth during the brushing process and after the brushing process. So that's how you got the, got the anti-decay technology in, in, into the picture, which was, a big, which was a big success when it came out because it, it catapulted us into market leader. So one of the, um, and then as you go down, always infinity, um, it's, it's, it's always is our sanitary napkin brand. Um, it's composed of a unique absorbent material um, that, that absorbs 10 times its weight in fluid. So, um, and the fluid, um, it, it's, it's really open-celled foam um, that allows the fluid to go from the surface all the way to the, all the, way to the bottom. So the, so the surface looks clean to the consumer. I'm very passionate about Always because I worked on this brand for 13 years. Um, um, process development, product development, everything. So this, this, is, this is truly something unique. And the way we got there was, you know, it, because it was a unique material, we, we didn't have good manufacturing uh, speeds. To, to get the right manufacturing speeds required a collaboration with scientists in India. And that allowed us then to be able to make it in, a, in an economical way, enough to be able to support the, support the um, price point we had in the market. And Tide Pods is, is, a, is a collaboration we had with um, a company called Monosol, which is a company in Indiana, and that makes water-soluble films. It was a complex uh, development because what you're trying to do is isolate mutually exclusive species, chemicals, from each other till such time they come in contact with water. So what you're doing is you're taking uh, surfactants, detergents, and so on, bleaches, and you're putting them in compartments which are which are cordoned off by, by layers of plastic. That plastic cannot interact, cannot dissolve, cannot, cannot let the components mix till such time it's in the wash. When it is in the wash, you have to be able to, the plastic needs to dissolve and dissolve completely, otherwise you will get residue on the clothes that are being washed. That was a collaboration we did with Monosol. It was a joint collaboration. We brought the teams together, and they did it all together. And so that's how we have grown, and we continue to grow. All right. So that might, seem, that might make it seem like, oh, they have been doing open, open innovation for a long time. Um, yeah, sort of. But uh, the reality was that life was good when we were growing up. Um, 
uh, up until like 10, 11 years ago, almost all the innovation that we were doing was sourced from our laboratories, internal laboratories. Almost everything was in-house. And if it had to be invented, it could be invented here, right? In that way, we are not atypical from other companies. If you look at the Palo Alto Research Labs, um, if you look at IBM, um, that's how all the big companies grew. We did everything inside. Um, and so we were not the exception. And then what happened was um, <laughs> we got a moniker, Kremlin on the Ohio. And those of us who remember the Cold War days uh, remember Kremlin. And it was a forbidding place. And nobody could go in and come out. Um, and we thought that was great. You know, It's all our proprietary technology, proprietary know-how, and we protect it. Great. So that, that's what we thought. Um, Till such time, we had an innovation heart attack. Um, and that happened in 2000. Um, actually, if, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, our stock price dipped from $116 per share to $56 per share in, I think, 48 to 72 hours. That was fun, watching that one go down. <laughs> particularly when your retirement is entirely linked to the stock price. <laughs> so uh, those of us who were, who were relatively young at that time said, my goodness, I think <laughs> all that got just washed away. We start over. And those of, her, those of us who were on the verge of retiring said, another 20 years, <laughs> because this is what it's going to take to recover. Um, but essentially what happened was our product launch success had dropped abysmally. It was only 35%. One in three launches were successful. Now think about what a product launch means. You know, at least 50 to 100 million dollars being invested in commercialization, right? Commercials, all that, all the, all, the, all the jazz, marketing support, coupons, everything that you see. That's commercialization. That's nothing to do with the product. You're commercializing it, it's marketing. So you're doing that and only one out of three is succeeding. We put more in. Let's see if you can do more R&D and therefore boost it. Couldn't do it. We were putting more in, and we were really putting in good money after bad. Stock declined. We needed a change. And the change happened at the, C at the CEO level. And um, the new CEO who came in was A.G. Laffley, or A.G. as we call him, fondly in the company. He made a breakthrough statement as he came in. And this was really one of those junctures which was transformative for the history of the company. And that was, we'll acquire 50% of our innovations from outside Procter & Gamble. Yes? Uh, question. How did he relate that drop in stock price with uh, in-house innovation, et cetera, so he was able to? I, mean, I, I can imagine that this statement is not directly related to the stock price, but uh, what, what was the thinking there? Well, the thinking was, um, at that time, um, less than 10% of our innovation was sourced from outside. And all the product launches that were going out there were basically, the, the reason they were failing was they were smaller ideas. They were not making a big connection with the consumer. So we were going with incremental ideas to the market. And, they didn't, and we thought that those were new product launches. But they were, the tru truly, they were small evolutions to what we had. We needed newer, bigger ideas. And we just we couldn't innovate the way we were with the inner think tank that was there. Okay. So, um, so the, the vision of what AG said was simple enough. So there are 8,000 people in R&D that we have in P&G. There are about 2 million scientists or engineers who are outside or working on roughly the same areas of science and technology. I will talk to, it's a great question. I, culture, as, as we'll go along, culture is one of the biggest enablers or impediments to, to, to open innovation. At the time it was, it was circulated, it, was, it didn't quite hit home because people thought, you know, we've been doing the work this way, it will continue this way, we'll, we'll see what that means. 
it takes time to, for a goal to trickle down. And that, that's exactly what happened in our case. So initially it was kind of like, I don't, I don't understand what that means, but you know, it's going to be, what is it you are truly doing to our projects? We continue to work on these projects. Are we working on something different? Um, and so it took time to, to take root. In fact, I was working in the business at that time, uh, leading, leading an, an initiative on Always. And I was telling Hank at lunch, um, I did open innovation without realizing I was doing open innovation. I had to do it because there was no way I would have delivered my initiative that way. But it wasn't because of what the CEO had said that I was doing it. I just did it because it, otherwise I would not have delivered the initiative, which would have been not, not so good. Um, and so um, it takes time for these kind of things to trickle down. But as I'll show you in a minute, it's helpful that it comes from the CEO and does not come from a middle manager. Okay. So that makes sense. So if there are, there's a lot more people outside, so let's say there's 200 times the people outside than inside, so it makes sense to source those, out, those, those ideas from, from outside. So great, let's go about doing it, and that's when the reality strikes. Where do we look? How do we search? And then the, the good old bugbear of IP issues, right? Because remember the Kremlin? We owned all the IP. Now you want to go and search with a partner. The partner says, so what's in it for me? So you got to give me some part of that IP, right? It's like, oh. So you say, I, I, and, and there are original arguments that can get, get constructed on it. And it'll be, now I'm going to, I'm going to call it PNG, but I've talked to enough companies to say, happens in all of them. So some of the arguments would be things like, um, well, you know, Okay, can I own IP in my area of business? Yeah, yeah, sure. What about, what about the IP that's outside our area of business? Well, that'll be owned by the other company. Oh, what if we were to diversify into that area of business? Yeah, but do you have any plans? No, but hey, who thought we, you know, we used to make soap and candles and now we do all these other things? We could, we may need it. Those are the kind of arguments you, you get into when you are the Kremlin. Because now you're trying to share. And when you have never shared in the past, it's much harder to make, build in a normal argument into it and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. To people experienced in open innovation, is of course that's the case. You, you, you know, you have to, it's a give and take. But when you're coming from an internally driven culture, it's much harder. And you'll be surprised how many big companies struggle with precisely that issue, even today, even today. Then there's a contamination conf confidentiality issue, which is kind of like if I go and ask you, what are you working on? Uh, I, I'm looking for some, some of this kind of stuff. Uh, are you doing something? And you give me an idea. Now, internally, I might have a much better line of thought or line, line of process that I'm going to follow. So I say, no, thank you. I'm not going to pursue that one. And then I come out with a product in that line person comes after, hello, I, we had that discussion, and now you, per, you commercialize the product. What's in it for me? Well, you didn't compensate me. So, the, so those contamination issues do come up, and you have to be very careful in how, we, how you have the conversation, litigation, so on. Um, so the way we, we chose to work on this was through culture, structure, and perception. And I'll go through each of these pieces in a bit. So culture, so we started with the CEO's goal, the 50% goal. And what the advantage we had was that we had high ranking believers who were at the top, at the top end, right? These were, these were top managers who believed that this was something we absolutely had to do. Once you get past this IP procedural issues and stuff, you find that scientists and engineers love to talk to other scientists and engineers. They do. And it, once you get past this and you get them seated and say, can we talk about this problem? It, it, it's a creative conversation. So people love innovation. Now, communication is just as important. You got to communicate the, precisely the question of, 
Okay, so you're bringing in innovation from the outside. That means you're not going to do as much inside, which means uh, my my chair may be at may not be may not exist in the future. You may be outsourcing my job, and you got to communicate to them. No, it's really doing more with what you already have. I want your brains to be working with the best brains outside to deliver initiatives to market. Right? It's just that the brains on the outside will help you make the connections that we just don't have inside and we don't have the time or the resources to develop inside. So that is very important to be able to communicate because otherwise it becomes like you're not doing it from inside, therefore you're doing it from outside. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. It's an and, not an or. Okay. Um, so that was the culture part of it. The structure part of it is um, you need to know, you need to be connected internally on what you are trying to search for. That sounds obvious, but if you are thinking about you know, a company which has 100,000 employees in it, it's a lot harder. Even just looking at R&D alone, that's about 10,000 people. And the, you know, we don't all speak with the same voice or, or with the same perspective. So we needed to be connected internally first. So we had to do a couple of things. First, we needed to invest in people who had deep knowledge of the business. What were the strategies? What were the growth strategies, et cetera? We then needed to find technology scouts. And these were people who were looking for ideas in various hotspots across the globe. right? Um, and you had to be choiceful where you situated them. Okay, so they needed to be able to develop the relationships there. This is not about finding the next shiny object. We had to embed C&D experts in the R&D teams so that when the question came up, should, can we do it outside or not, there was this person who was saying, yes, you can. Here's where you go, or I'll find out. Before somebody says, who knows? Uh, let's move on with an internal, internally staffed project. The problem with those things is, if you staff a project internally, it could be years before you know it won't work, right? So staffing a project is very easy. Getting results to market is much harder. And finally, when you do make a connection, we needed experts in transactions, which is like contracts and stuff like that, such that we had a win-win contract that allows genuine collaboration, okay? The third part of it is perception. So the Kremlin, is the Kremlin open? We had to convince others that it was. So we went to the media and we celebrated early wins. We talked about the CEO goal of 50% of innovation from outside. And then we opened a website called pgconnectdevelop.com where we invited ideas from the outside. And we also posted our needs on the website. Um, so this is what it looks like. We have it in multiple languages. I think there is, there is Japanese, Chinese, um, Portuguese, um, Spanish, and, and English. I think those are the five right now. Um, and then what you, are, what you are trying to do here is you're, you're showing up what PNG needs are. You're inviting innovators to be able to send in ideas that could be of use to us based on what our needs are. Um, and and, 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 and we also have a way for them to browse the intellectual property, et cetera, that we have uh, within the company. Now, this site was started four years ago. And one thing that I would ask from this audience is, send us your suggestions on how we can make it better. It's not a good site anymore. Yes? Through the website, we get about somewhere between four and 5,000 a year. That's what we get. Um, and um, and uh, not all of them are useful. Um, um, the, hit rate is pretty, the hit rate is pretty low. Um, uh, low single digits. Um, that said, <laughs> That said, low single digits on a 5,000 uh, base is 50 to 100 ideas that you didn't have at the beginning of the year. Hmm, not bad, if you know how to handle it. Follow up 
on that one. You say there are four or five thousand ideas, and they are good. How do you manage the pollution of the pollution? <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the biggest. That's right, and and it's one of the biggest biggest uh, challenges for all. For all all such websites, including innovation competitions, including crowdsourcing, including all, whatever the latest term is that you get in there. Fact is, you're getting a lot of things, and you need to be able to channel it. If you can't channel it, you're going to upset a lot of people. If you do channel it, then you need you're going to take a lot of resources. So. That, so the tension is how do you create an organization that effectively manages that and is able to, to respond in, in a timely way. So we have been able to do that. And today, if a suggestion comes into PNG, then um, our average response is about 15 days within which we give a, within which we give a response. So if, if something is submitted, we immediately send a thank you note. And then the assessment is done in 15 days. Now, if it takes root in the business unit, it will take longer to evaluate it. And if it doesn't, then the regret goes out in 15 days. So yes? Out of curiosity, I know is how many of the ideas that have been submitted have been commercial? It's a great question. We, we have a few that have gone into commercialization. The reason it's few is the, the development process, as I told you, it's not the shiny new object. It does take time to bring stuff to market in a, in, because we have global brands. So we have, I would say, about three to five the, in the last, and this website's been over, it has been around for four years. So about three to five that are either commercialized or are in the process. Now, that's, that's for technology ideas. For cooked products or things that are already ready to go, which can fit into an adjacency, there are many more of those. Okay, sorry, yes. I was just going to ask, um, when you get those good ideas, how do you pursue them? Do you bring that person in and discuss it further, or do you just kind of take their idea? And when they submit an idea, the idea needs to be submitted. The first scan we do is if they have intellectual property associated with it. Um, if they don't have it, we return the idea, and we don't even entertain it. Now, sometimes they'll bypass the system and you know, game the system and say, yes, we have it. And then, then you find out they don't have it, so you have to isolate. But basically, the first screen is, do they have IP or not? If it's not something you can own, then we have no interest in it. So that's the first, first screen, and that drops a lot of, lot of stuff. It's also a mode of education for a lot of people because the average inventor does not understand IP. So you tell them that, look, you, it's in your interest, but only then we'll look, take a look at it. If that comes in, then you have to go to the business units and figure out whether it's a match versus the strategy. And you have to do it in a, in a, you know, in, in a way that's, that's quick, but at the same time, it's effective. So you cannot deluge the business units with a lot of ideas because they have their regular jobs to do. So that's, that's the balance that you have to run. Yeah, we, without getting into a lot of detail, I think the, sim the, the simple answer that I would offer is, is the idea on strategy or not? So remember in a previous slide I said there have to be people who know the business strategies of the business units. So we first look against, is this even a fit versus the strategy that we have? So that's not an evaluation of whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. It's just whether it is a fit or not. And if it's not, then... And business strategies being what they are, because of limited resources, there will be, it's, it's, they're fairly focused. And so most of them don't fit. So what we do is then we, we make sure that we understand what it is, and we keep that in mind as we respond back to the innovator. But it basically returns the idea to the innovator. They can go and commercialize with, with another partner. And sometimes when we know a non-compete partner whom they could go to, we refer to them, we refer them to those partners so that they can go and get the business over there. Okay? All right. So remember that circle over there, send us your suggestions. Uh, please take a look and we would benefit from it. Thank you. Um, all right, top tips from our journey. So 
the first piece is no matter how good you are in sourcing innovation, if the innovation comes in and there's no one to receive it, then it's useless. So what may sound ironic is in an open innovation journey, the first place to start is your internal connections. Make sure you know that what you're working on is important to the business and what you are finding out is something that if you did find it, the business would accept it. Okay? That, that is very important. This was a place which I, I, I call that the ugly in our journey um, because our first technology scouts found a lot of shiny, interesting objects. And they felt, wow, you work on hair, we work in the, okay, great. Here's this dye colorant, here's this applicator, here's this whatever. This must be of relevance to the business. After all, it's connected with hair. But you don't know what the hair growth strategy is. So they lobbed it over the fence, did a lot of work, went to a lot of symposia, etc., and it kept coming and there was no, it did not take root. There is no nurturing ground to fertilize the seed. And so that's a big break. So what we did here was we learned. And so as we got into the business strategy of home care, where we came with the brand called Swiffer. How many are aware of Swiffer? OK, great. Um, so came with Swiffer. We found a use for the Swiffer home duster. It's a, I don't know if you, if you use it or not. It's a small little thing which gets in underneath the crevices and stuff like that, which is hard to reach. So that came from our consumer work. So Swiffer in and, in and of itself is very different. But then we, you, know, you, you have a dusting solution, but then you wanted to get into the nooks and crannies and you couldn't get there. So all the dust is actually accumulating there. Everything that you brush off <laughs> goes in there. So how do you reach those? We found that solution actually with a competitor of ours. They were not interested in expanding geographically. We were. They didn't have the marketing reach. We did. They had the product and the product development to support it. And so we had a deal and we were able to bring it to market in just about 15 months, much, much faster than we would have done ourselves. So knowing the business strategy can be, it can be a huge enabler. Okay, pick your partner with care and then trust their expertise. Do you want in a partner a collaborator, or do you want a contractor? You have to decide which one it is. A contractor is someone who is very predictable. That's what they do. You pay them a certain amount of money, they do it. A collaborator, when you choose to call someone a collaborator, you sign them up on equal terms with you. Never mind what their revenues are. There is no such thing as an asymmetric partnership. A partnership has to be symmetric. It has to be based on mutual respect. Well, here's our example. That thing over there is our home cafe, one of our shining examples of a failure. And I'll tell you why. The idea was great. The idea was basically, this is 10 years ago. The idea came from Europe, where they had um, individual home brew uh, home brewing machines, you know, so think, think about your individualized lattes in your home. Great idea. And we said, well, well, we'll bring this over to North America. It should take root. And the idea was good. It was good. Consumer studies said so. Then we brought in three companies who were some of the finest design companies. We brought them in and we said, okay, now, um, we want you to design this. By the way, um, here, are the, here are some of the you know, things you've got to do. You know, the, the price needs to be this. The design must be able to do this, this, and that. Um, we basically went about minding their business. As a result of that, we had a cost overrun, and we did not meet the flavors that the European coffee makers were able to do. So we didn't have the right profile on, on, on the flavor. We missed the cost deadlines. And 
we basically meddled with them. We turned a collaborator into a contractor. We failed. We learned from that. And when we went into the market with a, pulse, a pulsating um, toothbrush, it's called Pulsonic, Oral-B Pulsonic. It's in the market. There we knew nothing about how to achieve the kind of motion, the linear displacement that was required for a, for a Pulsonic brush. We found a company that had that competence. And we told them, this is what we want. Will you do it? And they did. And it was so successful, we went to market in one year versus five years if we had done it internally. And then they have since been innovating on that line for the last five years. And so we do not do any innovation in that space anymore because they understand what, what, what are the latest, the latest developments. They're better than us. All we do is look at the consumer research and the evolving needs. We give them that intelligence and off they go. Okay. Okay, then the third example is, the, the third piece is, you have to think of partnerships very broadly. This is our own, we are evolving our own definition of open innovation. Pampers Can Do it was a brand that was established for the, for the growing baby. As it becomes a toddler, it wants to be more independent. It wants to be able to do things on its own, right? Like pumping its own hand soap. It wants to be able to do those things. And the idea was, can we have a line of baby products that actually can enable the, the kid to do that? Even as they are getting, getting from, from tape diapers into pull-on diapers and so on and so forth. But once you put, on the, once you put out the product, you got to nurture it, right? You got to nurture it. What was it competing with? It was competing with the flagship Pampers business for resources, four or five billion dollar business. What chances did it have of getting any resources? Zero. So it was like, I don't know, kill the damn thing. Or in this case, we decided to actually enter into a, in, into a partnership, into a trademark out licensing agreement with a company called Nehemiah Manufacturing. And that's a story that I would like to show you a video on. Nehemiah Manufacturing Company started last year, August of 2009, right here in Cincinnati, Ohio. The mission of Nehemiah Manufacturing is to build a business, and just as important is to help build the community. We wanted to, to have a positive impact on the Cincinnati community, and that positive impact is, is going to be achieved by creating jobs, creating hope. In this case, we started with Pampers Can Do, a line of toddler products. As a licensee of PNG taking over the Pampers Can Do brand, we essentially manage the business for them. So we run the entire supply chain from R&D, new product development, through manufacturing and distribution of the product, and then we also do sales and marketing on Can Do. So we treat the business as our own. In December of this coming year, we plan to have a plant up and running right there in the heart of Cincinnati on the near west side. It's an area that really can need some help in the area of employment. Cincinnati does a tremendous job in the inner city of providing social services for those in need. But as we talk to people in the community, what they really needed was employment. They needed jobs. Those are the people we want to embrace. We want to get those people that need a second chance. Some people that may not be able to find jobs because they may have a record or they might have had some drug problems in the past. I think we can empower people and, and really have a positive influence on their lives. To be honest with you, it's a truly blessing from God, first and foremost. I haven't really been a good father to my daughter, but now I have some employment, I'll be able to be self-sufficient and be able to take care of my daughter. And it gives me an opportunity to grow in this company as well and meet other people, and plus to show them the skills and stuff that I have to be able to make the company grow. The main thing that I notice, they come and check on their employees. They always just come around, it's not just to sit back and like some other bosses do, just, hey, get to work. No, they come with a good spirit. They want to make sure that you all right as well. They care about you. And any time that I know about an employee care about me, then yeah, I wouldn't mind going 110%.
What's made the Connect and Develop program successful for Nehemiah and Procter & Gamble is our shared passion for people's lives, I think is what really makes our partnership successful. Okay. The fourth lesson is be open to new business models, and this speaks to what Hank was talking about, which was open service models. Um, it is a growing industry, and it was a great new opportunity for us. And we look, we, we'll, here we'll look at two, two businesses. One is the Tide Dry Cleaners, and the other one is the Art of Shaving. Um, so Tide Dry Cleaners is, is really growing, our, growing, growing Tide, which is a household name through a new business model, which is in improving service, improving technology in providing that service, and delivering uh, and, and meeting the unidentified consumer need. Um, I'll show you a, a quick video on this, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Dry cleaning in the U.S. is highly fragmented. This $8 billion industry is ripe for a new leader to take the stage and change dry cleaning for good. With the trusted Tide name directly linked in the majority of consumers' minds with fabric care and 92% brand awareness, we are poised to become that leader. Tide Dry Cleaners takes the entire consumer experience to a new level of service, quality, and convenience. Stores include double valet lanes, 24-hour lockers for drop-off and pickup, and same-day service when requested. Green Earth technology with amazing stain removal, color maintenance, and a fresh, clean scent along with additional special services to help bring the colors in your clothes beautifully back to life. We are raising the bar in quality and customer service with seven point inspections, not to mention Tide's 60 year history of innovative cleaning technology. Now's the time to join our growing list of franchisees, including Andrew Churn, and change dry cleaning for good. Okay, that was, that was not made for this occasion, so. Sorry, there was a sales pitch out there. But, um, but, um, but, but basically, what you have to understand is, before I talk art of shaving is, in what way is it differentiated? If, you, you know, if, if it's not differentiated, there's no reason to command a premium price, right? Um, it talked about some of the things, uh, you know, 24-7, uh, multiple drop-off, drop, uh, drop-off pickup lanes, all that stuff. That's great. What it didn't talk about, was some of the technologies that we are talking about. We are talking about spot lift technology, which allows you to take off spots. Right? Um, some, some people who are forgetful will leave their ballpoint pens open when they have that in the pocket. And you'll get this, this little blue thing over there, particularly in a white shirt, does not look good. Um, and maybe a new one. <laughs> so uh, has happened to me. <laughs> and so they have spot lift technology. Then they have something called back to black technology, which is essentially an additive that is, that is applied to in, in, in the process of laundering that allows the, the fibers to get bonded back together. A lot of the fading in the, in, the, in the fabrics happens because the fibers separate. So if you can bring them back together, you can, you can essentially make the cotton look newer or almost new and, and, and retain it over a certain number of cycles. So those technologies are invested in there, and, and that's how you try to differentiate it, yes? And, and, and so the, this being a service model, was it somebody else's service model that you put the Tide brand onto as an imprimatur, or is, is P and p &G actually operating these dry cleaners? This, is, this operates on the franchisee uh, model, mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the thought process was, was, was p and G's so in this case. That's right. Somebody who had a proven track record in, in, that, in that industry? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Well, the, the choice of franchisee is obviously something that you'll have to think about as to whether you've run comparable businesses or not. But they were not necessarily from the laundry market. Okay. Yeah. Um, the art of shaving is something that um, uh, I don't know. I have never personally used this because it is quite premium. It, it targets uh, uh, a certain demographic, which is the well-off male consumer. So I don't quite fit that demographic. Um, but um, but, it, but um, it, essentially, Art of Shaving is a brand that was, that, that was, uh, 
that was started. It was a company that was started by two entrepreneurs out of New York. And the idea is, is pretty cool. It's, it's about high-end shaving. It's talking about building a brotherhood of men who enjoy a superior shaving experience. I'll show you a couple of ads that brings the, that, that brotherhood. Um, um, but essentially, we partnered with them because we thought that we could actually get some, get to reach this consumer, and then it would offer us some cross-selling opportunities. It was a good idea. The business has grown, and um, uh, we we now wholly own this one. So here's a here's a couple of. Um, So you have the prepare, the lather, the shave, and the moisturize in there. So for those of us who are not very familiar with the art of shaving, this is my favorite. I'll teach those less smooth than myself the path to smoothness. <laughs> Whatever. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and so these are quirky, right? These are quirky. All of us recognize that there is a bit of bit of fun embedded in some of these things, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's really about reaching a certain demographic and trying to bind them together. Uh, a lot of this advertising is not PNG advertising. It's really art of shaving advertising. And this is what they use to build the company. OK. So fifth lesson, share what you can't use, then focus on the big win. Um, this is really about. Um, something that Dr. Chespro had talked about earlier, which is sometimes you get technologies that are sitting on a shelf that you cannot do anything with, and then can you use it to create value, right? So Tropicana is an example where, um, where basically um, we used to own a brand called Citrus Hill, uh, which was orange juice, and in the process of doing work on Citrus Hill, we developed a, a technology which allowed for more bioavailable calcium to be incorporated. We sold the brand, but we did not sell the technology. So it sat on the shelf. And then we were able to partner with Tropicana, who needed the technology and had a business. They had the reach, the distribution, and everything. And that was an out-licensing agreement that was a multi-year deal which benefited both companies. So you create value for both companies as a result of taking a technology which otherwise would generate absolutely nothing sitting on your shelf. Okay? All right, here's another example. Ooh, yeah. Thank you, can you handle this? Yep. Unlike regular trash bags, only Glad Force Flex bags have stretchable strength technology that helps prevent rips, tears, and messy cleanups. For stretchable strength, get Glad Force Flex. Okay, so, so that, that ad is really on, on the Glad brand, as you can see it. Um, the, the Force Flex technology is really taking plastic and being make and being able to imbue it with properties that allows it to stretch when put, with, when put under load, well beyond the original dimension. So this, uh, this technology came from diapers. And, if though, and this is probably the wrong demographic to be talking about diapers. But for those who know about diapers, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, um, we introduced a technology which had flexible uh, tapes that, that could be stretched to fit the different waistlines of babies. So it's really that technology that was deployed in Glad, Glad Bags. Now, we couldn't use it in diapers, but we could use it here. So this is a joint venture with Clorox that, that allows us to actually do this. Uh, this joint venture is one where there is not an out-licensing or in-licensing thing. We actually own shares in the company, and together we have grown it. So this was Force Flex um, that we are talking about. We also have what's called uh, Glad Wrap which actually has adhesives that are built into the, into the wrap. So if you have used saran and tried to wrap something which has plastic on it, you will know that saran doesn't work. Uh, but, but when you have adhesives micro-embedded into the plastic, you can pretty much press it and seal it. So it's press and seal technology that 
um, that was also developed out of diapers. Now we have come in with GLAD Force Flex bags with Febreze because we know that trash bags don't necessarily smell the way we would like them to. So, um, so it's, a, it's a growing business. It's created a billion dollars for, for the two companies. So not a bad model to have to be able to leverage. The sixth idea is pick your people and then place them with, with care. The brightest scientists or technologists may not be the best negotiators. Okay, in fact, some of them may be your worst because they are so married to the idea that they come up with or they are so sharp about it and then anything that is said against it in a negotiation mode becomes a personal attack. So open innovation calls for a special skill set. Not everyone can do it. Um, you have to be able to have what we call stroke. Stroke is, is understanding you should have technical depth, but at the same time, you should be able to negotiate with confidence and poise such that you can generate trust in the other party. And that is extremely important. So what we do is we have a core group of people who are within business development. Business development uh, houses the connect and develop part and the licensing part. Um, who are continuity players, who are there all the time, and then they have expert skill sets. And then we have people who rotate through connect and develop and move on to regular business um, in, in order to be able to nurture some of that stroke. So it's, it's part of that culture that we were talking about. That culture comes through actually doing the work and being cognizant of it. So our best scientists are not necessarily where you want to be. Um, they could be, but sometimes more is better. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, they're from within PNG. We are a promote from within company. Mm -hmm. So they're all from, from inside. Yeah. Now, when we started Open Innovation, it was a one-to-one -one deal. You know, you, you work with a partner and you do something. The present is that you are working one-to-many, right? So PNG is working with multiple partners to bring an innovation to market. So an example is Perfect 10, which was a hair dye that, that gives high gloss color in just 10 minutes. So it was a breakthrough in the, in the category. It involved 10 partners, three different uh, technologies, and multiple IP applications that allowed us to bring this to market. The flip side of it is many to one. So the Live Well Collaborative is something that PNG has, it's a consortium, where the outside partner is University of Cincinnati, and there's a consortium of, of, of uh, companies, including P&G, Boeing, Kraft, et cetera, who get together to talk about, they, they have basically formed a design consortium that talks about how to deal with the aging consumer. So if you, imagine, if you can imagine, you know, um, how do, as, as a demographic ages, what are the adjustments that need to be made in the overall product and service portfolio? for these different companies. Now, we are in very different businesses, but you can imagine an airline seat may have to be designed differently. An airline bathroom may have to be designed differently. Um, a bottle and uh, you know, how you unscrew the cap may have to be designed differently. Um, how you open a package may have to be defined, designed differently for the older consumer. So all of these needs come together. We bring these needs together, and the design forum then allows us to benefit from each other's thinking. It's a great experiment, um, live well collaborative. Innocentive is really our crowdsourcing arm, and we, we have used that to source multiple ideas in, in, in response to a particular problem. And we have had good success with them, though by, you know, they, most, of our, most of our problems usually get solved through our own networks. So, um, that's one to many or many to one, the future is likely to be many to many. So you have to be able to create the right results um, by, by leveraging our networks. That said, sometimes more is not better. Just having thousands of networks is meaningless if you can't nurture them, right? So you have to be selective about those few networks that can deliver disproportionate value for you. That is the holy grail in open innovation in my mind finding the right networks that deliver 
value for you. Uh, the other thing that has to be, that is a corollary of that is technology cannot replace personal connections and you have to be very careful about that. You can't think of just sitting there and saying, I'm just gonna find out in cyberspace who's, who's the best person and I'll click that one and they will become my partner. Remember, there is one major gap that has to be overcome. It's a chasm that you have to bridge and it's the chasm of trust. If the partner doesn't, touch, doesn't trust you, they will not work with you. And it doesn't matter how big you are, how much price you can bring the partner. For the partner, who is typically an asymmetric partner, someone who has a much smaller business than you know, uh, you know, $80 billion, that particular technology or that particular piece of IP is their crown jewel. That's all they have. So they are only going to work with you if and only if they're assured that you will be a fair partner for them. So that, that's very important. So that's why technology cannot re replace personal connections. It's all about having fewer networks whom you can nurture and build a relationship with. Invest in your partnership. You, you can go ahead and help a partner, and you should, because what you do to help them often comes back to help you. So Velauda is a partner in China who has helped us deliver um, bamboo uh, products. Uh, like the, it's, the, it's the Febreze home collection um, where you have various products that are shown out here that allow us to be able to take bamboo to the market. Um, we help them in some ways, and I'll show you a quick video on this one. Zhejiang Weilaoda Industry and Trading Company was established in 1990. In the beginning, we started making chopsticks from bamboo. In a short time, our business grew to include kitchen utensils and small furniture. We Chinese have a saying that we can have a meal without meat, but we cannot live in a home without bamboo. At Weilaoda today, we use bamboo as the primary component for more than 20 different product lines that we make, more than a thousand products. But at the end of 2008, PNG come to Weilaoda looking for a wood product supplier for the base of their Fabrice candles. At the beginning, we could not meet PNG's specifications on consistency. So, we worked with PNG researchers and universities who helped us develop new technology that allowed us to meet the needs of the Febreze business. Currently, we mainly supply the work components for the Febreze home collections, including the base, stick, and collar. In 2011, we will be working on another two products. We now have about 10 different components we co-developed with PNG. PNG teams help us create more efficient production lines with greater quality control, which has made Weilaoda a much stronger company. Our PNG partners also connect us to their experts in plastic to help us develop a new environmental friendly material using 60% bamboo and 40% plastic. We are using the blend in a new line of cutting boards and other products we are making for many companies. And we are working with PNG on other connect and develop projects for the future. Through PNG's open innovation approach, more and more small and medium-sized entrepreneurs like Wei Lao Da are transforming themselves to working as innovation partners of multinational companies. PNG's Connect and Develop partnership is allowing us to create joint value together for customers in 32 countries all over the world. It's a win-win for everyone. All right, so before I go there, I think the important thing to understand is 
what made the Vilauda partnership work. We were looking for wooden bases. The wooden bases would have to mesh with other components. The tolerances were very, very small. Okay? And we figured out that we couldn't use wood for that. We had to use another material. So we said it had to be a harder material than wood, but it would be very, very close to wood. So we came into the bamboo part of it. Well, Alda was a, a top-notch manufacturer of bamboo, but they were, never, they were not used to making those kind of tolerances. They did not have statistical quality control and things like that. We were able to teach them that. And once they got that, they were able to develop what we wanted. Beyond that then, they started working with us on multiple projects, but then they had a contract that came with a Japanese company that they had to turn down simply because they wanted a bamboo plastic composite. And they had no, no expertise in plastic, but we did. We obviously have a very large packaging um, capability organization, and we were able to help them with that. And uh, they were able to get the contract from there. As a result of these kind of partnerships, I think the important thing to understand is that when you invest in a partner, you get dividends beyond the obvious reciprocity, right? And this is true for open innovation overall. So we, we like to say, in, like in a good marriage, it's about falling in love all over again with the same person. You have to renew your relationships and you have to invest in it. Marriages work and so are these relationships. And sometimes you invest in them without hope of return. And when you do, the partner figures out ways, intangible ways of helping. They may help you or they may refer another partner to you or they may generate goodwill for you within their industry or uh, adjacent industries who may then come to you and say, yes, I want to work with you. And here's what I got. Did you, um, can, can we work together? And, and ignites all sorts of spontaneous thoughts that you would not have otherwise. So it's an investment and you have to sometimes invest for the long term. And this is a good example of that. Okay. Um, I think we have talked this one. Focus on the win-win. The way we look at it is, if you cannot sign on behalf of your partner, it's probably a bad deal. So in trying to divide the marbles, if you kept most of the marbles for yourself, then you probably structured the relationship in a, in a win-lose. You may win today, but you will lose long term. That partner will never work for you again. Um, and the reputation, your reputation, particularly in this connected world, is defined with every deal you do. All it takes is for one or two partners to spread the word through the internet, through social media, through their networks, to say, don't work for them, they'll, come, they'll, they'll get you. And that's it. You got a gotcha, you got a gotcha around, your, around your name which can hurt you in, in, the, in, in, the, in the relationships you seek. So, so, so it's important to do that. Um, the other thing you have to realize is you got to fight for your partner in the negotiation process. This sounds counterintuitive because you're representing your company. Sounds almost pious, right? Sounds idealistic. But you got to fight for your partner in the deal making process. And then once the deal is done, typically the work is done by a business unit. It's not done by you. It's you as the open innovation practitioner who must go back and say, how's it working? And you have to ask the partner and you have to ask the internal person. Internal is not necessarily bad, but often there can be misunderstandings. You've got to clear it up. So it's about a relationship. You've got to keep tabs on it. That's why we call it connect and develop. It's not just connect. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll leave you with this. Can't be everything, can't think of everything, can't be first, and really nobody cares where the good ideas come from. This is the only thing that matters. And open innovation is one of our key innovation strategies that we are using to be able to deliver that. That is, it is a journey like we started and said, it's not like we are there, but it's a journey we learn from our mistakes, 
and you have to stay humble and you have to stay hungry to be able to do it. It's an evolving field and it is intimately tied to the growth in technology. It is touched tremendously by the internet obviously, but increasingly I believe it is touched with social media. That hasn't happened yet in the field of open innovation, but it will. It will be a trend and that's where you have to be careful how many partners you play with and you, once you pick them, they better be the right ones. Um, because you cannot afford a, a social media profile that's negative. So while you may not, while this does not equate to Facebook, but that's where it's headed. And that's my prediction for this one. Social media is the disruptive force that you have to be careful about. It can be a positive if you nurture the right networks and attract the right partners. Open innovation done right, people will make you the preferred partner, and that's our goal. And social media can be a huge help for that, and it can go the other way as well. That's it. Thank you. Okay, I think we've passed around some of the samples, so everybody's got some uh, examples. And were these, by the way, uh, samples that grew out of open innovation initiatives? Some of them did. Okay. Yeah, some of them did. And there are some notepads and stuff here. You can pick them up on the way out. All right, um, so nobody should leave empty-handed. Um, let's take some comments and some questions. Hi. I, uh, my name is Toshiro Kita. I'm from Kyoto, Japan. Yes. Yeah, I know the PNG have a bit excellent the management style in open innovations. But I have one question. The uh, marriage is very easy, but the divorce is a little bit different. The company who can make a good divorce can have a, another marriage. So uh, I don't know the what type the management style, the management uh, secret, uh, and the withdrawal uh, from the partnership uh, or quit of the uh, productions uh, realized by the open innovations. Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, the, I would say that the key is communication. And, under, and making the partner understand why we cannot continue. Conversely, the partner may be going through changes. And key is to understand what changes there are. If there are ways in which we can support the partnership, we would like to. And if there aren't, then we, then we part ways, but always with a positive attitude. Easier said than done, but that's exactly the way you have to go do it. Um, it's, it. But communication is key. Not always do we do it that way. And there is often the times when you have a change in company priorities, change in strategy. And suddenly you decide, OK, yes, I know we were making those, those water bottles like that. We're not going to do those anymore. We're now going, no, no more plastic. Thank you very much. We're going to have steel or whatever. Not all, uh, but also the uh, social. Maybe you uh, said uh, reputations is very important. Right. The, 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 social, the, the social media part of it actually is what I anticipate as a trend. It hasn't happened yet, but, but I think it will happen. Um, the communication here, what I was referring to, was primarily of the partner, because every partner has their own partners in their own innovation network. So if you break off in a bad way, all those partners also get to know about it. And so that's, that's in Japanese, we call it keretsu. And so keretsu is very important. Odaiji desu ne? So maybe just to keep in that metaphor for just another minute or two, before we have divorce, sometimes we have marriage counseling. And you were describing in your comments that uh, one of the roles that you've developed 
is after the transaction is uh, signed, the relationship is underway, the business unit within P&G is now uh, interacting with the partner, uh, you've made it a practice to go back and check with both sides. How is it going? This is where the marriage counseling comes in. I was wondering if you could just take, with, without having to name names, if you could pick one where you did that and you looked in and you found a, a pretty interesting misunderstanding between the partner on the one hand, the business unit on the other hand, and, and how you were able, if you were able to resolve it. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll give an example of an academic partnership where we were working with a research institute. Um, well, then we can name names. <laughs> A research institute of prominence. <laughs> um, this is in, in this is actually in the in the um, um, on the net. It's a pub, public um, it's a public release. So this is with A Star Singapore, and um, uh, and this is a multidisciplinary institution. Um, and what we found was we were trying to work projects with them, and we were finding some issues in terms of. Um, it was a quirky issue. It, it was it's really nothing to do with science and technology. It was with processing of payments. And so when you do open innovation, scientist to scientist, administrator to administrator, manager to manager, sometimes you miss out the people who do the accounting. They're not part of open innovation teams. And there was a problem in the, in the payments being made. There was a lot of frustration because the invoices were being issued. Payments were being released, but they were not getting there. So there was some internal accounting issue because the projects were being contracted with P&G globally. So there were partners in Germany, there were partners in, you know, in, in the US, and they were working with our, our company in Singapore. So there were some internal pipes that weren't flowing, the, the, there were some bends in them and the water wasn't quite going through. So by delving into the relationship aspect, we figured out quickly, okay, this is not a scientific issue or a relation, this, but this is a relationship issue, get the accountants involved. And we got finance, global finance involved in that and they fixed the problem. So that's, a, that's an example of how things can go wrong. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the, the, the point you made about not being afraid of new business models. Um, on a project like Thai Dry Cleaners, where you're moving into a service business and you're franchising and it's completely outside of P&G's normal uh, comfort zone, I'm wondering, since those projects, uh, what are some of the major lessons you've learned in, in moving into a new business model like that? I, I, I think we are on that journey, to be honest with you. Um, and we started that model, I think, in 2009 or so. So it's only been a couple of years. And um, I, I would still say that we are on the learning curve. Um, can't, can't really tell you what, what, what the good, bad, and the ugly within that. But I think if I come back for another lecture in a couple of years, I'll be able to tell you that. Uh, it's, it's learning in progress. It's a great question because it's, it's completely outside your core competency. Um, but it is something that you have to migrate to, as this book says, because traditional products with the proliferation of channels and everything else, um, you, 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 you have to be able to provide a service with them, with, with traditional products. So you need to learn as much as you need to, you know, so this is, an, this is an, an example of how we are going in there, but I'm sure there will be other experiments that we'll be running to learn, um, uh, and we'll see. Yeah. Does anybody here not understand what it means to say you're franchising your business? Is anybody unclear what that means? Or does everybody think they understand what franchising is? Okay, well, another, another time if you're curious. Um, I want to point out that you made a big mistake here. Uh, college students don't do their laundry. They bring it home. Um, but uh, apart from that, uh, something struck me, and that is that it seems that you, you mentioned your, your brand vision, you know, tap the innovative power of the world. 
as well as the brand essence uh, dedicated to touching and improving lives. Do you feel that there has to be a really great, strong brand strategy before you can have open innovation? I think the answer to that is an unequivocal yes. If the if open innovation is a way to do innovation, as much as modeling and simulation plays a role in the development of new molecules, new compounds that deliver breakthrough benefits. But you before you go role model that, you got to go figure out what is your end benefit. How is it going to make you money? And that is all part of the business strategy. If it, if, if, if it didn't make money, you wouldn't put it there. And so that's why you have to go against this shiny new object thing. Look what, what cool idea I found. So yes, it has to be intimately linked to business strategy. And that's why some of the things I was saying was think internal first, because that's what will kill or nurture your open innovation strategy. It's just a means to an end. Uh, two related questions. Um, I'm wondering if you had to develop any special software capabilities to facilitate your development of Connect and Develop. And relatedly, if you think, if you say you have about 8,000 R&D staff, um, do you have any sense of what proportion of those would be software specialists? Okay. Um, the software, um, the software. Um, that we use is really about, you know, re remember when you were talking about four to 5,000 ideas coming in, we do use software to be able to manage some of that. The software does not do the screening, the software does the routing. And it allows you to efficiently route good ideas to the right people, and if the ideas are not a fit, efficiently be able to draft, draft this, this kind of stuff. So, that's one part of it. The software also plays a role in searching for solutions. So I mentioned Innocentive. We do not take, use Innocentive as a rule. It's used as an exception when our internal networks do not deliver. That internal network is also based on software. It's not great software, but it is software. We are evolving there. Um, to answer your second question, um, we really do not have anyone specializing in software within our 8,000 people. They, there are people who do modeling and simulation and other things, obviously, um, but not necessarily software for connect and develop. Uh, we don't do that. Yet. We haven't done that yet. But, yeah. um, in, in your partnerships and collaborations, you, you mentioned Live Well, where I guess you're working with your competitors as well. And beyond that, how do you manage the um, IP, I would just call it, uh, against your competitors? Let's say Unilever, how, how do you manage that they don't get the same partnership? Yeah, the Live Well Collaborative is a non-compete partnership. So we bring in, we, we bring in people who are not our competitors. Um, so they work in different fields. Because if you bring in a competitor, um, what input would they have that's different from yours? They're thinking about pretty much similar stuff. Um, a, and B, yes, they'll fight you for that IP. And so, no, we don't, we, so that's a non-compete. There are competing consortia, obviously, um, and you will find some of those in the medical industry. And you will find them because because early drug development or early drug discovery, as they call it, is extremely expensive and highly risky. So it makes sense when you're looking for the cure of can cancer or something like that to be able to pull together resources at the base, to be able to come up with something that you call a platform. And then you say, now, based on that platform, I will have targeted endpoints that I will chase with my drug, which may be different from the ones that you might chase. And that's fine. It's based on my understanding of science versus yours. And let the best person win. So that's the way I have understood it. So you can have compete consortia, but those will have to be for very well-defined needs. Uh, just to interject a short personal story, uh, after class last week, uh, I went to Qingdao, China, 
to the headquarters of Hire, which is one of the leading Japanese electronics uh, white goods manufacturers uh, in China, now increasingly around the world. And at lunch uh, one day there with a group of three other people, at the next table to us was a group from Procter & Gamble talking to people from Hire. And they were literally trying to figure out what the right detergent would be for a washing machine that would wash clothing without water. So it was really for the sort of the bottom of the pyramid, uh, part of the marketplace. And it gets back to this notion of a brand strategy and really being able to touch people's lives. Uh, Hire, as a company, wanted to get machines out to rural areas where water supply is not, is intermittent and sometimes not available. Uh, and who are they working with to build the detergent that you still need detergent to wash clothing even if you don't have water? Well, they were working with Procter & Gamble. So it wasn't, strictly speaking, I suppose, true connect and develop because they've had, I think, known each other for a long time as just partners. But it is an example of two companies in, in complementary, not competitive businesses trying to figure out ways to work together to solve problems uh, out there that uh, need to be solved. So that was just a, you know, I, did, I remember Ashish was coming here this week, and so I wanted to tell you about that because I had this wonderful aha moment sitting at lunch watching this interaction going on. Any final questions for our speaker? Okay, well, next week we're going to have a speaker from Wipro. Uh, their, chief, their chief technology officer is going to come and talk to us. So we're going to shift the focus uh, probably toward India, and we are going to shift the focus towards software. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you all then. And please give me back my attendance sheet wherever that went. Uh, and join me with a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs>